Hi everyone. Thank you so much for the uh, the invitation to come and speak. Uh, it's really amazing to be here and uh, to see all of you in front of me. That that's really fantastic. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm from Open Knowledge. I'm Open Knowledge International. Um, I work on a few projects, and um, I'd like to talk uh, about this project with you uh, today. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about Future TDM, which is a project that I'm involved in, and also a little bit about uh, frictionless data. Um, so a little bit about open knowledge. Um, we are an international nonprofit organization. As you can see, we are based all over the world. We have uh, national chapters. Uh, so yesterday there was somebody from open knowledge uh, Germany. Uh, we were founded in 2004 by Rufus Pollock. Um, I myself work in, in uh, London, but again, you can see that we are uh, truly international. Um, so. Uh, we have a vision about the world and what data, uh, what role data should play uh, in this world. Um, uh, basically, we want information to be available for people to um, to be used uh, in a pos as a positive influence on uh, on society, and to hold governments and also companies accountable. And we want to help that. Uh, we want to help people do that. And how we do that is by uh, we develop project. Uh, we have projects. Um, various projects um, about opening up information, but also to help people to uh, access this kind of information uh, and to be able to use this information. So, for example, we have School of Data, is where we uh, we teach citizens to use uh, the various tools, um, to, to, to teach them a bit about programming, mm -hmm. to also um, help them find the data that they need for the kind of projects that they want to do. Um, another one is open spending, is where we have uh, developed a, um, a platform where people can access um, information about um, the budgets of the governments and what they are spending these budgets on. So this is another way in which you can hold your government accountable. Um, another one is uh, CCAN, which is an open source data portal platform. Uh, this one has been adopted uh, by uh, governments all over the world and it's quite interesting. Um, and um, this relates to uh, uh, another project that I would like to uh, pay your attention to is uh, frictionless data. Um, so in the development of this portal, we, uh, uh, we encountered some issues and we've been talking to, um, uh, to the people who want to use the data, but also to the people who make this data available, such as publishers, about the issues that they have in, in, in uh, making this data available and also to transport the data from one person to another. Um, so this basically led about uh, frictionless data. Um, wouldn't it be great if data was, if you were able to transport data from one person to another without having to deal uh, with all of the, the, the messiness that certain types of data have? So we like to use the analogy of uh, a container. Um, uh, well, when I came here, I, I, I drove past um, loads of, of containers. And in transport, you have the, the, these really uh, generic containers. You don't know what's in them, and you don't really need to know what, what's in them, because this way of transporting it makes it easy to and frictionless to transport uh, data. So wouldn't it be great if we had the same thing for um, all of the different data types that you can have? So this is basically frictionless data, uh, developing a standard, um, tooling and integration, and uh, we also want to build a community around this. Um, so basically the goal is to help um, use and share data um, and to make this easy and possible. We have a few of key principles is simplicity, of course. Um, we want to use the most basic formats. We don't want to make a new format. We don't want to use what's already out there. Um, it should be web-oriented, uh, built for the web. The formats should be uh, a web-natural uh, or a web-native format, such as JSON, of course. Um, also, it should be uh, used easily with existing tools. So integration, everybody has tools to use uh, CSV, for example. Um, so it's supported by almost every language that makes it easier. And it should be open. I mean, we are uh, open knowledge, so we find it really important that the community adopts these, these kind of things and helps it with them uh, to develop them further as well. So uh, for uh, frictionless data, if you're interested in this, please contact us to, um, uh, to see uh, if you want to give some feedback, but also if you think that this is useful for your project. 
because we are really in, in the, the developing phase yet. There's something happening on my screen, just one second. Now oh, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, my role at Open Knowledge is about Future TDM. Uh, Future TDM is a, a European funded project, so we have a few uh, consortium partners, um, we have universities uh, in Europe, we have uh, um, other research partners, I mean we are there with content miners in it. Um, and what we are doing is uh, we responded to a call from the European Commission. Uh, they want to know why the uptake of text in data mining is uh, not happening as much in Europe as they expect it to be. So I think this is uh, something which is also um, uh, an issue here in, uh, in Taiwan and in different countries. Although the European Commission has uh, seen that um, it appears to be that in the US, but also in Asia, the uptake in certain countries is quite, quite, quite good. So uh, we want to learn from other people about their experiences with text and data mining and see how we can improve and what we need to do to improve text and data mining. Um, so yeah, the objectives are uh, improve uptake um, by actively engaging with stakeholders. So that's our role in this project is we want to uh, go and reach out to the community and see, okay, what is actually happening on the ground? So we're also doing uh, academic research, so we're looking at the legal aspects, for example. But it's all good and well that these legal aspects are uh, working at an academic level, um, what is happening in practice. So the challenges and opportunities, that's basically why I'm also here and what I would like to uh, engage you uh, uh, in. Um, TDM opportunities, we work together with content mine. So what is the benefit of doing text and data mining? Why would you do text and data mining? So um, the poor fellow on the left, you see his table is stacked with papers. This is basically a researcher trying to do research so what they do is, um, uh, somebody told me, um, if you are a PhD student and you're being asked by your supervisor, for example, or by, by um, uh, the main uh, person doing the research, to help him with his research, you are, will be charged with going through 100 documents a day to figure out whether or not these are relevant for your research. So as a, a human being, you can only do so much. Um, this means that uh, basically like 60% of your time as a researcher will be spent in finding information. That means you're not analyzing this information, you're just trying to get the information so that later you can do uh, an analysis. This can be done much, much quicker by the use of software. So text and data mining can help you, can reduce the time that you have to spend on finding information and finding if this information is relevant or not. Um, so that's a huge benefit, of course, of text and data mining. So it reduces the time, but it also increases the amount of text and data that you can use for your research. So whereas as a human, for example, you would be able to go through 100 papers a day, a computer can do that for you, can go like 10,000 papers a day. I mean, imagine how much more information you can use in your research. That's just amazing. So that's what text and data mining can do. Um, Content Mine is a quite interesting um, uh, software product. Um, it's developed uh, to indeed help you do this. So um, uh, if you go to the website, you'll see an example for the Zika viewers. So they wanted to know, okay, what is this thing? What is going on here? And how can we find data which is related to this to figure out if, if there's something that we can do? So uh, in the biomedical research, um, if you would type in this keyword in uh, their search engine, you would find all of the information that mentions this, or all of the publications that mention Zika in one way related to anything that has to do with it. Um, so the software works incredibly fast. You just type it in and like five seconds later you will have a long list of papers that are relevant. There is of course still a human element. You still have to select the ones that, that are relevant, but um, at least you don't have to go manually through all of these publications. For example, you will have 80,000 publications. Um, with the, um, uh, text and data mining, you can bring that down to like 4,000. So that's another huge benefit of text and data mining. Okay, so if this is so incredible, why is the uptake so low? What is it that makes people not do text and data mining more? And this is basically where in the project we are right now. So we are um, asking people, okay, what are you experiencing? Oh, um, 
So yeah, I'm, I'm organizing uh, meetings, uh, I'm going to conferences and talking to people, I'm having interviews. Um, and I can share a few of the, the, uh, the thoughts that uh, people have or the issues that people have raised already. So one of the issues is an access barrier. Um, I don't know, I, I assume that there are plenty of researchers here who might have uh, seen this screen pop up when you try to access a publication. So you hear about the research from somebody, you click on the website, they say, this is all great. If you want to read it, you can pay for it. Um, this may not happen as much if you're in, uh, linked to an institution. So if you work at a university, your university may have already have access to these kind of papers, but that means they probably will have a license with the publisher. So one of the issues that a lot of researchers bring up is indeed we want to have access to all of these papers, but we don't have access because they are behind the paywall. Um, I don't know how many people know SciHub or are uh, willing to admit that they know and use SciHub. Um, so this is something that has been uh, discussed a lot in the research communities. Um, um, a researcher made all of the publications available on uh, their website with the idea that information, that um, uh, research should be available for people because it is governmentally funded. Um, it's in their eyes ridiculous that you then have to pay for it again um, if you want to access this kind of uh, information. So also for text and data mining, this is quite a problem, um, or at least that's what uh, the researchers are telling us. Um, if you want to use software to access publications, um, you are faced with these, um, uh, these technical barriers, for example. Um, so for a publisher's website, you would have to use their API to access these papers. So that's what um, uh, the publishers are telling us. If you want to do text and data mining, there's no problem, you can use our API. The researchers say, this is a problem because the APIs are not sufficient. I'm still getting blocked when I want, for example, to download um, 80,000 publications a day. I get blocked by, by the publisher. So these are the issues that we are facing uh, right now, and these are the discussions that we are having right now. So on the one hand, we have, for example, the researchers, and on the other hand, we have the publishers. So other main challenges that we are uh, experiencing and that we are seeing is awareness. A lot of people don't know what text and data mining is and whether or not it can be useful for their research. So we need to, to, to talk to people and we need to talk to um, universities to see if this is something that they should uh, put in their curriculum. I mean, should everybody know what text and data mining is and should they know how to do it? Um, that means, could mean, and that relates to the technical barriers, that they have to learn how to code. Because at the moment, there's not any out-of-the-box tool that will allow you to do text and data mining. So you will probably have to do some kind of coding to make it um, applicable to your own research. Does it mean that we should uh, invest in, indeed, teaching everybody to code, or should we just invest in having uh, more tools available for people that are easy uh, to use out of the box? Um, and then, of course, we, we have, I already mentioned, uh, some of the legal barriers. So a lot of papers, for example, have copyright. How are we going to deal with that? Um, it can also be that you want to access information that has uh, privacy issues in them, or uh, privacy information in them. Um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to take the rest of my time to um, hear from you if you uh, are having any experiences with text and data mining. Um, if you want to share, maybe you have found a solution uh, around one of these issues. If you think that you had, there is no problem at all, um, maybe here in Taiwan nobody has a problem with doing text and data mining. Um, or if you have any interesting case studies, um, I'd also uh, like to know. Um, so yeah, can I open the floor to anybody who wants to uh, share something? Okay. Is this on? Yes. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is very trivial. Is uh, when do you think <coughs> the first data mining software would be released? Uh, and if uh, the other one that you cite in the This one. Yeah. Um, how is it possible to contact the text and data mining community? Is there a website or something? 
Okay, so, um, yeah, I'll... I'll Thank you for your speech. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, so, our research um, is focusing, is, is indeed trying to look at what is already out there um, uh, in the field of text and data mining. Is there, is there indeed a community of text and data miners? Um, there's a bit of an issue, perhaps, if I talk about text and data mining, because there is a huge community doing text mining, and there's also not that much of a huge community, but there is a community doing data mining. Uh, so in linguistics, they have been doing text mining for ages and ages and ages. So they also don't really think that there's much of a problem. They've been doing it. It works. It's fine. Um, so there are tools available. Um, uh, Is there a website for the community? Or? Yeah, so, so for our, our project, you can go to Future TDM. Uh, FutureTDM.eu. That's our, our, our project website, and all of the results from our research will be available there. So uh, at the moment, some of our deliverables are already available, and everything else that we are um, uh, making will also be made available there as well. Um, yeah, one of the tricks indeed is um, do people know that uh, there are tools available, and how do you find them? I mean, if you're a bit computer savvy, you might know of, of, of GitHub, and you can search for tools on GitHub. But still, then you need to um, uh, know how to use um, uh, code, for example, to be able to teach it how to um, uh, work on your specific data set. So at the moment, there are tools, but if they do, if they work for you, that really depends. Um, uh, content mine is available. You can go to the website, uh, and 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 you can definitely try it out. I'd really advise everybody to try that out and to give them also feedback to improve um, uh, that tool. But thanks for your question. So, are we? Do we have any text miners in the audience? I'd love to hear. Ah, yes. Hello. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was a student, uh, I think the, there's a big problem about how much time do my computer need to compute it. Right. <laughs> yes, and uh, it is really annoying because uh, when when the research, well, uh, when, when I was doing the research, first I think this, this method maybe work. But the problem is it takes maybe one month to calculate it. Mm, okay. It, yeah. This is a really big problem. And, and yeah, my, my, and my team just changed uh, change how to calculate it. But the the result is not that good. Okay. Hmm. So, yeah. I, I think it's a really, really big problem because because always we, we want to try to uh, the the target is big, but our computer is not that big, mm -hmm. <laughs> big enough to calculate all of the data. Right. So. Um, your solution is not to do it, in that sense, <laughs> okay? Um, <laughs> or the, 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 the consequence of the issue is not to do it. Uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's better to maybe share some um, better method to do it. Because okay. the cursor or something like that is it's, it's not suitable for for the normal personal computer. Hmm. Yes. When, when there's maybe 10 years data to calculate it. Okay. Yes. Uh, when there's 10 years data to calculate it. And it's not really, really suitable for any kind of student to have a machine to run. Hmm. And we have not so many times on um, because when when 
the deadline of my paper <laughs> is not that far away. Mm -hmm. It's maybe just a week or two weeks later. Yeah. So I think it's, it's hard to find a method to cognitive quick much more faster. Yeah, so, so you would vote for having better tools? Yeah, better tools. That would help people? Yeah, that would help. Right. Or maybe better machine. A better machine. But, but that costs a lot. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, cool. Oh, okay, he'll, he'll translate for me. Yeah. So basically, the issue for European countries or how to deal with that or how to communicate with the government. Uh, 资料, hmm. Yeah, okay, so the, uh, the question is about um, um, Publishing privacy, uh, uh, private information or uh, uh, data that has privacy issues in them, right? Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so um, uh, um, I assume you, you, you know about, um, or at, at least in Europe, we have the, um, uh, the Data Protection Directive which is soon to be a regulation. So in Europe, there is indeed um, uh, a reform, you could say, um, on privacy. Um, so um, data that can uh, relate to a, um, uh, a person, there are strict regulations whether or not you are allowed to make this public. So at the moment when we are discussing these issues with governments, um, they usually use this as an argument not to make data open or not to make data available. Uh, because yeah, they say uh, we can't guarantee that this data is anonymous, um, so we can't make this open. And um, uh, I think on 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 a national level, most of the governments are, are are quite good and aware in what data they can make open and what not. So, um, but you really see at more regional levels, um, uh, the 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 default method is uh, when in doubt, don't. So keep it closed. Um, so even if you would, you could argue with them, but this is not personal data. This is the, this should be open. They would would still not do it because they kind of fear um, um, the unclear regulations, basically, because it is it is quite unclear. Um, and and then of course, yeah, uh, one issue with with, um, uh, with personal data or with with sensitive data, um, the fear that you are going to combine databases. So maybe this database um, uh, and this set of data does not really identify anyone, but the moment you start to combine it with something else, it can indeed start to uh, identify people, and then you would fall under the uh, uh, under the regulations, and they, they are, these are quite strict. And also the sharing of data, which is, makes it quite difficult to do uh, international research, because of course the European Union has different um, uh, regulations. They don't like it that you share data across borders, and that's yeah, that's that's quite unfortunate. So. So if we have data, but right, it's okay. So he has another question about oh, the yeah. sector. Okay. Oh, sorry. 
your question about the private sector. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, w I wish I did. <laughs> yeah. Um. Mm. Yeah, I'm 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 struggling a little bit in in in, in knowing how you would get that kind of information. Um, yeah, I wish there was something like a Freedom of Information Act that you could use for companies as well to make data open. I think the the the, the only thing that you can do is really get groups together to pressure companies. To really say that this is good practice, like we, we and and um, yeah, l like for example, we have put pressure on 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 Google and on Microsoft to uh, publish the, these transparent transparency reports. So that would really be uh, yeah, at the moment, I think the only way to 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 get this. Yeah. Okay. So what other approach to have the pressure on whether it's private sector or on government? How do you put pressure on them? If, if there's a different approach, you mean? Yeah. Um, the, hmm, hmm. Well, I think the arguments you have to use are different. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult. I'm not sure. Any examples? Um, God, let me think what we're doing. Yeah, it's 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 yeah. I'm 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 a little bit. I'm not. I don't want to say brainwashed, but um, I'm a little bit in the whole political uh, field right now. So it's quite difficult to say if we can put pressure on uh, <laughs> on 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 uh, the European Commission, for example, because we we have to work with them now. <laughs> so <laughs> let's let's leave it at that. <laughs> Well, 然后过一段时间告诉你们真的没有那么可怕谢谢嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯
what we are doing is we will we are organ uh, organizing knowledge cafes where we bring together or try to bring together everybody from the different communities so they also try to uh, or start to understand where the other person is coming from because um, it's quite easy to talk amongst yourself if you are in the same community it's really a lot harder to explain the same thing to somebody else and then you also hear their um, uh, background so may maybe they have reasons why they can't make s certain data types open that you have not thought about so if they explain why it's difficult for them you can then together figure out how we can uh, make this happen may maybe they need training about how to use Google Forms it and that's the reason why they don't uh, know how to use it or they don't use it but they don't tell that to you so that's basically uh, one of the things that we are experiencing. It's just really get the different people together, which is a challenge in and by itself. But yeah. Great. Thank you.